Why Pitch Cry for Help by Problematic under slash Lana on AO3. Chapter 10. Greenie Needs Our Care. And they went home. Before leaving the hospital, the couple went to explain to the kid that he could no longer stay there and that he was going to stay with them until he got back onto his feet. However, the doctor was still in the room, looking confused at the way Yamada signed away the kid. She took the other hero to the side and whispered, I'm sorry, Eraserhead, but you sure the kid can understand that? It may be better if you explain the situation to him. That won't be necessary, as you can know sign language. We believe he could have been taught as a baby, even. And he had to say, the name of the kid had a nice ring to it. Did something pop on his physical exam? Oh, his physicals. No, not at all. Are you under the assumption he was born deaf? He didn't respond, just nodded. There wasn't really a reason to believe he wasn't. After all, he didn't respond to his name at all. But again, there was a possibility of him just not being able to communicate and learning for that reason. He wasn't born deaf or mute. We usually check for that matter when we see a muzzle, but it's not the case. I think I gave you all the medical records, but I'll check that. After that, he was given some extra papers on medical exams he had at another hospital, a quirk specialist hospital. The first conclusion Aizawa had was that then the muzzle was quirk related and there had to be something else as for he knew the sign language but he was even more bewildered at the diagnosis he had at four. Quirkless. Attached to it, even the x-ray of his foot, showing the classic signature of a quirkless person's feet. What the hell was going on here? He could clearly remember the instance on the alley when he found him. There was no physical evidence of this quirk, but the hero would bet his hero license that the kid had one, and that he had erased it on the alley. He promised himself to talk to Isashi about what was really happening with Izuku, but at another time. The way the kid was looking at the loud hero was enough to not even be able to be mad at him for not talking about bringing him home before. He really needed a calm and safe place to stay at, and truth be told, if the quirkless status was in his record, he was inevitably going to have a hard time in the foster system. The blonde had excused himself, saying that that way the medical bill would be footed by his insurance and that he just needed a place to get his health back. Aizawa thought it could have been two things. One, he saw how Aizawa got attached to him. Two, he saw the kid in a muzzle and wanted to give the help he wasn't given. He hoped it was the first one. They had the space and the money to help the kid, and they had barely talked about kids. This would be a nice test to see if they would be up to adopting in the future. He just didn't want to admit that the idea of fostering this specific child made his heart tingle. The feeling only grew a little at the sight of the kid shyly grabbing the blonde's hand to get off the stretcher. The way home was silent, and when they got there, the kid was noticeably anxious. His hands pulled on his hair ever so slightly. Making the first step, Yamada entered first, turning on all the lights and giving the kid and a reassuring smile for him to walk inside at his own time. How does dinner sound, little listener? He added, singing and speaking at the same time, something he usually did when at home. The kid waited a minute or so, taking in the view of the place, then turning to Aizawa, who he was obviously more comfortable with. He didn't seem to find whatever he was looking for, because he looked again at the blonde, and then at his shoes. Aizawa took that as an opportunity to try something. Even if you're not hungry, he should eat a bit before going to bed, kiddo. His husband opened his mouth to say something, but stopped when he saw the kids tear his eyes away from the floor to look at Aizawa. He then nodded slowly. So, it was true. He wasn't deaf. Mike put two and two together and looked at his husband as if he drew a third eye. Well, technically, he did tell him Izuku was deaf, but to his defense... He actually thought he was when he told him. As I was stayed at the sofa with little Izuku while Mike made dinner, they both know how to cook, but with the dietary restrictions the kid had, it was better to leave it to him, who was much more experienced in the kitchen. They settled in one of the two lovebird sofas in the living room. He helped the kid get up and surrounded him with chunky pillows to help him be more comfortable due to his ribs. But the kid truly showed no signs of being in pain. 
as all hoped it was because of the painkillers, not because of a built-up pain tolerance. They ate dinner on the coffee table on a futon. Yamada made some simple soup and broth with some cooked vegetables that would be easy for the kid to digest, and then he added some red meat and noodles, not wanting to make the kid feel as if they were eating something better. He also put a white rice bowl in the middle of the table to see if the kid would want some. The second they started eating, the kid tried getting up, but Aizawa put a hand on his shoulder to indicate to him sitting back down. At least try some. If your stomach is too upset, we can sleep after three bites. He said, maintaining his voice firm yet soft. He wanted the kid to know that he was trying things before refusing them, but that no one would force him into anything. The kid sat back down, looking confused at his plate, and then at both of them. If there is something you don't like in it, you can take it out. Mike tried talking, needing to experience firsthand the kid responding to sounds. I eat now, the kid signed. With adults? The couple looked at each other. Was the kid raised differently, perhaps? It was obvious then that the problem wasn't the food itself, but the way it seemed to be presented, or how they decided to go about it. We usually eat together, yes. Aizawa simply stated. Affected enough, the kid started eating. No one had the heart to say anything, for the kid was making an absolute mess of the table and the floor. Soup going into the rice, his clothes, hell, even one of the cats seemed to have a stain. He was doing his best, but he didn't want any help, and his hands were heavily shaking, and the way he used the spoon proved to not be efficient. There would be time later to teach him that. He wasn't able to finish the whole soup, and God did he try. This poor kid was absolutely stuffed with only half a bowl and no rice. Aizawa was warned that the kid would only be able to stomach a little, as he was used to eating little to nothing. But that didn't help the feeling that he was letting him starve through the night. Hisashi had absolute heart eyes when he cleaned Izuku's mouth with a napkin. The kid just let him do whatever, kind of trying to hide the fact that he was cleaning the floor with his t-shirt when they were taking the dishes to the kitchen. They helped him take a bath, but at that point the food had settled and he was half asleep, so much so that he let them try to wash his hair as far as possible. It would take a lot of work to get rid of the matting, but for now they were happy enough with him not sticking the whole house. They would have to try again tomorrow with the kid a little more conscious. Funny enough, he was completely asleep by the time they slowly patted him down with the softest towel they had making sure not to hit any delicate spots or sensible letterings. Yamada almost cried at the sight of the kid's back, a huge burn scar going from shoulder to shoulder. It was healed, but horrible to see in a kid nonetheless. Sadly, because of the emergency situation, they didn't have a room ready for the kid, and they didn't want to put any kind of pressure by making him sleep with them, so they settled in all of them sleeping in the living room, with lots of blankets and pillows, and tomorrow they would have the time to put together a room. At the end of the night, early morning, really, the couple made a small nest of blankets and pillows for the already conscious kid to rest in. Aizawa thought that the frown in his sleep made him look older, and Yamada thought that it didn't really par up well with his baby fat he still had in his cheeks. But even with a heavy heart, they were able to fall asleep too, and the comfort of finally knowing that the kid had a good place to stay in, and people that would do anything to care for him. All right, my biggest note that I want to talk about is Izuku's eating uh, restrictions, specifically the fact that Izuku's eating little, right? After going so long of eating, you know, little foods, right? You can't stomach big stuff, right? Um, you slowly have to up your intake and this could take years till you're finally back to normal or one year depending on how long or how bad that habit was. Uh, for example, me, it's taken me three years to finally be able to eat a normal goddamn meal. Like, I'm joking. I used to eat so little. Like a slice of pizza, I had to choose between eating the pizza or the crust. Right now I can eat both and I can even eat two slices. I've gone as far as eating four slices. That is immense. My stomach really, really hurt after it. I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but no, yeah, after like a long, prolonged time of like 
a diet where you're eating small bits or um, an ED or for example, you know, in Iziku's case, not having food to eat, um, your stomach can no longer handle as much foods. And in fact, taking a lot of foods after not eating a lot can actually damage you. Like it, it is actually bad to just out of nowhere eat a bunch of food, right? So to go from eating very little every day and barely surviving to eating a full meal, three full meals a day, yeah, no, that's gonna do more harm than good. You have to slowly introduce your body again. You have to slowly alchemate. Uh, otherwise it can be very, very harmful. But uh, next thing I want to talk about is, I wonder when Izuku is going to talk first. Like, when Izuku is finally going to say a word. Maybe it's going to be by accident, Izuku accidentally says something, and then he panics, and then, you know, obviously, um, Aizawa and Hisashi are like, it's fine, you can talk. You're not going to get in trouble for talking, we want you to talk, we'll encourage you to talk. And I, I want to I say that, I just want to see him good and finally happy. Now, as much as this seems like we're on the high stretch of, you know, everything's gonna be positive, there will be drawbacks. As I mentioned before, healing is not a linear passage. And as someone in my comments once said, sometimes you go left, stay there, stay for a year, and then take three steps back and go back on, you know? It's, it's not even a straight passage. Sometimes you go sideways, sometimes you go backwards, you go forwards, you go sides, you... you. It, it can be very, very much different, you know, areas. Um, but healing is not linear. I've always said that. And I love that this is probably going to show it as non-linear as well. But as always, my rain jobs, make sure to eat, sleep, drink water, take your meds, have a wonderful day or night. Link to my discord server and socials are down in the description. Subscribe to see more of my content. And thank you so much for watching.